webinar is now live. I see some friends joining us as I always do. Very exciting and very validating to know that I can operate a Zoom webinar after 15 months of doubting my own abilities because you never know. So excited to have everyone back on this very special and very bittersweet and very fun episode of The Lunchroom. Um, I don't know where all of you are right now, but I am north of Boston and Mark is otherwise in New England and it is a scorcher outside. So we hope you're staying cool and comfortable and appreciate you sort of taking up your lunch hour to be online and virtual with us for this amazing lunchroom. Mark, how are you doing? I'm great. You know me. I love this sort of heat and humidity. Yeah. So I was to be in it. I don't trust you because of that, but you know, we'll figure it out. <laughs> no big deal. We got this. Uh, super excited to be here again, as always. I am Sarah Schofield Manser. I am ART's Assistant Director of Special Events and Partnerships. I use the she series of pronouns. I'm going to just describe myself for anyone following along at home who is maybe listening to this like a podcast or has visual impairments. I am a white woman with dark brown hair that's pulled back in a clip because of the aforementioned hot weather. I'm wearing my favorite spring and summer blouse, which has shown up multiple times in the lunchroom, but it's <laughs> a, a Hawaiian shirt with like bright floral patterns, and I thrifted it, so I'm particularly proud of it. And I've got headphones in, and the background is a really plain yellow wall with a prominently featured air conditioning grate that is currently um, turned off so that you can't hear the blowing of the AC in my house. Mark, over to you for an intro. Hi, everyone. Um, you just saw my eyes darting because I was texting my mom because I realized I was supposed to tell her about the lunchroom today, and I forgot to send her the link. Oh, so that's you. Um, hi, everyone. Mark Lunsford. I'm the artistic producer at the ART. Um, I'm a white man getting a little bit of a sunburn the last couple of days, um, and with a sort of short brown hair uh, and a brown beard and mustache, wearing a white t-shirt. I've got some sort of wood panel doors behind me. Um, I'm actually calling today from uh, Ludlow, Vermont, um, which is the traditional unceded territory of the Wabanaki people. Um, here, and it's, what you can't see is I have a beautiful sort of vista in front of me of a lake and some mountains, and it's a great little, great little summer escape. Oh, we'll rub it in. My vista is of my neighbor's very beautiful yard, but you know, it's not quite the same as a fantastic place. <laughs> <laughs> so we should do a little bit of Zoom housekeeping and some additional info before I turn it back over to Mark to lead us in our fantastic conversation with our amazing guests. First and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge that the land that Low Drama Center and Oberon occupy is the unceded territory of the Massachusetts people. And I myself am calling in from north of Boston, which is the territory of the Massachusetts, Wabanaki, Pentucket, and Penacook peoples. A few bits of Zoom housekeeping to clarify. So the chat will be disabled, so you cannot communicate with us using the chat. But we do encourage you to submit questions for Mark and our guests using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can also turn on auto captions from Zoom. Uh, there should be a button at the bottom of your Zoom screen that looks like it's an icon with three dots and it should say more. And depending on the update, the Zoom update level you've got, it will either show you an option to turn on live transcript or show subtitles. So if you'd like to follow along with those, they're automatically generated by Zoom. So they are not perfect, but they're pretty fantastic. Uh, a few other notes to hit really quickly. Some of you might know that the end of the fiscal year is upon us. Tomorrow is June 30th. And after that, we are in a new fiscal year, which is super exciting and amazing. But thanks to the generosity of a group of anonymous supporters, every new or increased gift made to the ART between now and tomorrow will be matched two to one up to $65,000, which will double the impact of your gift to ART. And if you make a qualifying gift, you do get special benefits over the course of the next season, which I find to be particularly intriguing because we're coming back, y'all. We're going to be back and better than ever. So please consider making a gift to the ART between now and tomorrow. Again, having your impact doubled by anonymous generous supporters is incredible. Um, and we would love for that to happen. There will be a link that I'm going to pop into the chat as soon as I'm off camera, and you'll also be automatically directed to our website after the webinar ends, if you are so inclined to make a gift to ART. So thank you for that. And then the last thing I would like to say before I hop off screen and allow the, the fun part of the conversation to go is I do want to read ART's anti-racism commitment statement. Uh, the ART is unequivocally opposed to hate, and we center anti-racism as a core value. We expect everyone in the ART community, including our audiences, to uphold these values. And as such, we will not tolerate anti-Blackness or racism of any kind in our buildings nor at our online events. We aim to create an environment that is uninhabitable to racism and to discrimination for all BIPOC staff, artists, volunteers, 
audience and community are seen, heard, valued, and provided the opportunity to thrive. This work is only possible when we do it together. So thank you, our audience, for being our partner in it. Without thank further ado, thank you, Mark. I'm gonna hop on. This, oh, this is our last, on. it's our last goodbye for a bit. I know. I. <laughs> I've been trying to avoid it because it makes me very sad, but it's okay. You know, yeah. this is our last lunchroom before we take a little summer break, but we'll be back. Back in the fall. Can't wait. It's been a great year. It has been. It has been. And it's a little strange to think we've been doing it for over a year now, but yeah. looking forward to our next one. So I'll see you all in the fall for another lunchroom. Amazing. Yeah. Thank Bye. you, Sarah. And thank you all for watching today, um, you know, for this, this send off episode, a send off in many ways. Um, and I, I kind of want to jump right in. Um, and, you know, a long time ago, I had asked Diane if we could um, have a conversation in the lunchroom um, just before uh, she left for, for um, her next great gig. Um, and her and I have been chatting about kind of who to be in conversation with and what to talk about. And I think we've got um, a really, really fun conversation for you today about um, career and mentorship and relationships. Um, and so without further ado, I just want to bring on this incredible team of guests, friends, um, and, and, uh, conversation partners today. There's Diane. Hi, Diane. Hi, Ari. Hi, Kevin. Hey, there's Natty. Hi, everyone. Um, so why don't y'all just introduce yourselves? Kevin, if you can kick us off, I'll, I'll sort of pass to each other. Sure. Hey everyone. Um, my name is Kevin Lin. I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, I'm based in New York City, uh, and I was an undergrad at Harvard, uh, graduated in 2012, um, and got sucked into the theater world via Diane Borger and Mark and Ari on this call. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am currently an agent and co-head of cultural business strategy for a creative artist agency. Great. Maddie? Hi everyone, my name is Maddie Burson. Uh, like Kevin, I went to Harvard. I graduated in 2014. Um, I was not sucked into the theater universe by Diane Borger, but was certainly kept in the theater universe by Diane Borger. Um, I am a producer of uh, all kinds of live events and lately a couple of movies and albums as well. Ari? Hi everyone, I'm Ari Barbanel. I use she, her pronouns. I was director of special projects at the ART from, oh my God, when? 2008 till 2016, <laughs> an associate producer for Oberon, um, and departed to take on a role that I carry now as uh, executive director of the Winter Walk, which is an initiative around awareness around homelessness in the greater Boston area. But today, I'm in the greater Maine area, and it's very hot, so you'll hear my fan in the background. <laughs> Ari, I forgot that you left in 2016, as if 2016 couldn't have been a worse year. <laughs> it's the year you it left here. a lot. I left in November <laughs> of 2016. Wow. Um, and last but certainly not least, Diane. Hi, I'm Diane Borger. I serve as the executive producer at ART until tomorrow. And um, I came in 2009, um, not ever dreaming I'd be here this long, but here I am. And uh, although I'm American, I've mostly lived in London. So I'm returning to London to do the only thing I know how to do, which is put on plays. So I'll be joining a new company there. Well, thank you all for, for being here. It's so, uh, like I said, great to be in conversation in particular with this group. Um, I kind of wanted to start with uh, some groundwork, right? Because I think folks often don't know what many of us do in the theater. I don't think it's always very apparent. Um, so I kind of wanted to start with what I think might be a, a, a more fun question, which I wonder if each of you could answer both a moment from your childhood or the moment from your childhood when you first remember thinking, that's what I want to be when I grow up and sort of what that thing was or who you saw do that thing that made you want to be that. Um, and yeah, just uh, drawing the connections to what you're all doing now, um, which I think is interesting. Diane, do you want to kick us off? Uh, yeah, that would be great. Um, I, I know exactly what it was. And my story is very straightforward. Um, when I was six, my mom 
came home from seeing a play and she said, next year you can go with me. And I remember that the following year I went to the local high school production of Music Man. And seriously, the only first and only time in my life I thought, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to work in the theater. And um, it was unwavering. And no one in my family works in the theater. It's not kind of what our family does. So it was, it was really one of those bolt from the blue moments. And the hardest, not the hardest, but perhaps the difficult part for me was not knowing what to do in the theater because I never wanted to be an actor, which is unusual because so many people start that way. I didn't want to write plays. For a while, I couldn't understand quite what a director did, but I thought maybe that's what I want to do. So it took me a while to figure out that there was somebody who did this other thing that I do, which is produce plays. So that's me. Amazing. <laughs> oh, Music Man. I always tried to get Diane Paulus to do Music Man <laughs> because that was the show. Yeah. I didn't I didn't understand that Music Man connection. That makes That's more sense now. <laughs> that was why. Yeah. Maddie, what about you? Um, you know, I I've had a <laughs> I've had a very different experience of what I've wanted to do with my life. The first time I remember um, seeing somebody do something and thinking, I want to do that, is I um, saw someone playing the tuba in a marching band, and I thought, I want to do that. Um, it's never come to pass, um, but <laughs> unfortunately for all of us. Um, but uh, no, I, I actually came to theater. Um, well, there is a connection. I'm finding it. I'm finding it. I came to theater because um, my parents stuck me in an acting class because I was a really shy little kid. Um, and I loved it. Um, and I think, uh, like, like Diane said, like, like many people, I started out, um, acting, which I did for most of my childhood and, and teenage years. And, um, I came to producing actually because I, I love the theater, but acting really scared me. Um, like there was just a certain degree of, um, I don't even know what to call it exactly, but like, there was something about the the vulnerability and the uncertainty that I so admire in performers and, and is why I still do what I do. Um, but a big growing up moment for me was realizing that I don't want to do that. Um, and for a while I thought that um, that meant I wasn't going to work in the theater, um, how wrong I was. Um, still wish I played the tuba though. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of brass band themes going through here. Ari, I hope you can keep that, I hope you can keep that going. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I played the flute in third grade. I don't know. There is a tuba player in the house that I'm in right now. So Maddie, I, I have a hookup for you. Hook it up. Hook it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it's funny that this question came up now when just the other day, my, I have an eight year old child. She's finishing second grade and I took, you know, like the one piece of art that was sort of indicative of her second grade cuteness and put it in the bin of memories. And I found this thing that I had from second grade. Um, and it said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And pretty much wrote all the things. I wanted to be a doctor, a nurse, a fashion designer, an actor, a director. I think I put movie star because that's different than actor when you're in second grade. Um, so I think wanting to be all the things is maybe part of who I am. Um, but I came to theater pretty quickly after that uh, and did follow that route of also performing. Um, but then, uh, when I graduated college and we wanted to make theater, somebody had to do the business of theater to make theater happen. And I realized how essential and important and amazing that was and switched gears and went through grad school for arts administration, uh, in Boston, uh, after leaving New York and did my internship in grad school at the ART. Uh, and thought I would be in the development department at ART. That's where my internship was. And then I said, oh, raising money is hard. Um, being a producer is so much easier. <laughs> um, that's a lie. Uh, but found the artistic department at ART. And, and that really took the business of theater into my life in a, in a really important and big way for the next close to 10 years. But then I left. <laughs> and now I'm doing something that is... Uh, equally fulfilling for me and wonderful and has strange similarities in uh, running large-scale events to raise awareness, which I think 
connects very deeply to producing a piece of theater. It's about engaging people, about creating a conversation. It's about creating energy in, in a place together. And so I find a lot of what I did in producing theater and what I do now. Yeah, I think that's your that's a, a great point that I, I definitely put a pin in because I want to come back to that. I think there's a lot of a lot of ties there. Um, Kevin, I hope you have a brass band tie-in. Well, my, my brother plays trombone, so that's about as close as I get. But <laughs> Di Diane still makes fun of me for for what I want to do when I grow up. Um, I I remember very distinctly when I was young. Uh, I think the first movie I ever saw in theaters before that I don't remember this part was but was the animated Lion King. Um, my mom tells me that I dragged her to the movie theater three or four times and we weren't really a movie going family. Uh, and I remember saying to her at one point that I wanted to be a zookeeper when I grew up. Um, and she, her reply to me <laughs> very smartly, she's a, she's, she's a smart lady, she's a physicist. Um, she said, you know, zookeepers, all they do all day is pick up animal poop, right? You should be a biologist instead. Um, so that set me on my trajectory to actually, actually to go to this point, which is that I, I ended up at Harvard doing my degree in organismic and evolutionary biology. Um, and uh, in the process of sort of finding myself and exploring um, uh, different internships and different extracurriculars in college, just as an extracurricular, I found myself at, at the ART. Um, and then it was really the, yeah, I've told all of you this before, like it's the people on this call that that got me in the door and convinced me to stay in the door. And Diane still said, you know, if my parents are too disappointed in me for working in theater, I can still go back to biology. I can still go get that PhD. I can still go do those conservation biology documentaries that I wanted to produce at some point. Um, and I'm sure that that's her plan for me coming up next. But uh, but it, for for now, I'm 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 in this world, and and it's been almost ten years, Diane, since I left the world of biology. Which is nuts. Yeah, that's insane. I, I um, you know, something that that you were pulling on Ari, which I think also goes to what you were just saying, Kevin, about the way that theater sort of sits in this universality in in our lives or touches so many things. Um, and I was thinking particular about even even artists that so many of us share, right? Like all five of us have a very direct connection to Daniel and Patrick Lazor in a very specific way that is different in so many directions. Um, I don't know if many of us know this, but our, our husband Sam have worked with Daniel and Patrick on some of their solo folk career. So it's just like so many deep connections, I think, that come from having these these interests. Oh my gosh, the Lazors are watching. Now I've just embarrassed them. <clears throat> um, so uh, I, I feel I, I had a very similar story. Um, in terms of having nothing to do with the theater um, growing up, um, not really understanding it. Um, I really wanted to work on the field crew for the Cincinnati Reds, like just that like running out and like sweeping sand off bases in the middle of baseball games seemed really exciting. Um, I think that was the first thing I, I thought of, like I went to a baseball game and saw these guys just like run out and do a bunch of yard work in between innings that I thought, wow, that would be really fun. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I definitely, I had a very different kind of view of, of, of what I would want to do. Um, and even in college, you know, I was a dual major in business and theater and the theater major was always like, it's kind of fun. And, you know, actor training will help me as a business person. And uh, it, it was never thought of for me as like, there's a career here. And, you know, I was in rural Ohio, there wasn't a lot of uh, professional theater to look at and sort of understand or, 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 or get that there was a whole career there. Um, obviously I've, I've interested stuck with it, but even in this capacity as producer, I would not and did not understand as a career path until I started working at ART in a different job. Um, so I think, you know, it gets into the, sort of the next thing I want to talk about, which is what mentorship can do. But for me, certainly the way that Diane, that we worked together and you sort of showed me that there was this other career, um, I think is there's a lot of opacity in what we do sometimes and that, and that there are these job paths and there are these opportunities in so many different directions and in, in the theater. Um, I wonder if for any of you that sort of existed, right? The sort of like mystery behind the careers that are available or so the depth that the industry reaches. Yeah, I, I, can empathize uh, hard with that, Mark. Um, my family is not um, a family that's in the arts or does anything 
of that nature at all. Um, most of most, yeah, my parents and and one of my sisters are all um, government workers. So I um, was really lucky to be raised around the arts, but I had no idea um, that there was any um, there was any career in them for me after I decided I didn't want to be an actor anymore. Um, and even I remember arriving in college and, and I don't know, for those who don't know, the relationship between student theater at Harvard and the ART is very um, intertwined and very strong. And um, we uh, share space or we, I, yeah, but you have to you have to tell me what things are like now or we're like, but um, we shared a lot of space. And um, throughout my, I guess, early years of college, I wasn't totally sure that, uh, that theater was what I was going to do with my life either. Um, but I did make a lot of student theater and I did um, get to know Diane through that. And, and I remember a conversation we had where um, I was like, you know, I know what it's like to do this here, which is just like figure it out, um, you know, solve problems, uh, do show the end, uh, do what it takes to get the thing done. Um, what's it like in the real world? She's like, like that. Um, and <laughs> I remember that making it feel so much more accessible to me and um, and uh, it, to be able to see my own experiences producing a theater, which is something I really love to do, but certainly had never considered as a career path, um, uh, kind of come uh, into into flower for me. And, and uh, yeah, I remember that, that really helping me understand that like, oh, I could keep doing the thing I do for fun for my job, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's that idea of accessibility that gets to the core of mentorship, right? I think if you can't find your way into a field, then there's no there's no hope for you to have a career in that world. I think for me, showing up at the ART as an intern, getting coffee on the workshop of Prometheus Bound in 2011, um, was an extracurricular in the way that it did like Model UN, and that I played violin in the pit orchestras that Maddie uh, for the musicals that Maddie was producing through HRDC. Like I had no intention of doing any of it professionally. But I think the thing that changed for me is when I showed up in that artistic office, walking those doors, right, with no experience in theater whatsoever. Um, it was, you know, Diane and Diane and Mark and Ari um, and Allegra and, you know, the, the folks who made it, who, who just said, there, there isn't, a, we're not going to hide anything from here. You, you can see how the, how, you know, you can see how the, the sausage is made, right? We're, we're going to take you through step by step and show you that it's not an impossible thing. It's, that yes, there is magic in the work that we do in the theater industry, but the process behind it is very technical in a way, right? And it's very accessible. Um, uh, and you don't have to have a graduate degree in this field to do it. You can be a biology major and, and come in here for the first time and we're gonna, we're gonna let you make photocopies and we're gonna let you uh, get us coffee and then we're gonna show you how a stage management thing works for a week on this workshop or we're gonna let you sit in on this casting session. Um, I think just that kind of exposure and that access uh, was was what made the decision for me to move into this field because I just felt like there was a community that cared about me, right? Um, not to say that the biology world did not, but you know, I was Diana remembers this during during Wild Swans in 2012. I was in tech for that show while I was writing my thesis about tailing the evolution in beach mice, and on one hand, I was with a group of 30 Asian people working in theater. And on the other hand, I was alone in the basement with a CT scanner and a bunch of dead mice. And <laughs> going from one direction to the other, it wasn't that hard of a choice to make, I think, um, when I look back on it now, at least. Ari, I wonder, I, I, I can't quite like draw such a such a great vivid picture, Kevin, because that was pretty amazing. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm wondering, um, pulling more on what you were saying earlier, sort of the way that having a sort of mentorship and producing or in, in theater has like connected what you were already saying, the power of storytelling to what you do now in this sort of like raising awareness and, and working with charitable side. Yeah, I think there was a, a fear when I chose theater as my professional path um, and, and a stigma from others. You know, maybe we've had family members who've like, what are you going to do with a theater degree? <laughs> you know, that, mm. that, that moment happened a lot in my life. And I thought, oh gosh, I'm, I'm sticking myself in this hole. And if I don't do this forever, I, what else am I capable of? I don't know. And I think uh, my experience of mentorship with you, Diane, sorry, I'm gonna have to talk about you. Um, <laughs> Everything we worked on together, everything we connected about in that process of being a producer at the ART uh, 
100% connects to everything else I do, everything else we all do. I mean, the lessons, the conversations, the feedback were never about wild swans or about OPC. I mean, they were just about how we get things done. And they were about trust. I mean, that was the biggest thing, I think, um, just trusting that we do what Maddie said, figure it out, clean up the mess, make it happen. And that is a skill set <laughs> that we all have now, maybe even more so than people who haven't worked in, in this like baptism by fire environment where you, you got to get it done. Uh, there isn't another option. And, I and I take of, that I, with me. I do a yeah. lot of it. When people are always astounded by the level of, um, well, that's, uh, I should say, that's like my side hustle. So I do theater stuff, but then, you know, also do similar to Ari, like corporate events, marketing events, that kind of thing. And people are always astounded by the, the like tenacity and also the, um, the detail orientation of theater producers, because we really kind of get thrown right in the fire. Yeah. And I think the, like the calm under pressure that, that this group that I've observed from everyone in every situation. I mean, yeah, I mean, we make Kevin stage manager workshop with like two days notice. <laughs> we were like, why don't you do this? <laughs> but it was, okay. But it was great. And, you know, being in the, the field that I'm in now as an, as an agent, I work with a lot of theater producers, right? Um, uh, and I would say that the calm under pressure that you're referring to, Ari, Maddie, Mark, Diane, like that's not, that's not the norm from my experience right? There's a whole lot of messiness in our industry. And I feel like the, somehow the energy that was created in that environment at the ART over the past 10 years allowed for a group of people to really be able to learn their craft and also put it in the greater perspective of how we are as human beings and knowing that none of this is life or death and that, yes, we, we run into um, uh, to, to crises within our industry from time to time. But, you know, I, I, I can never remember a time um, where any of you lost your cool. Um, and maybe that was behind closed doors and you just didn't let me see it. But I feel like <laughs> my model for how producers should act, how we should go into negotiations, how we should go, like it's a pleasure negotiating deals against Mark Lunsford because I know him as a human being, first and foremost, right? And Mark, I'm coming back to you because there's something I'm not happy about for a client. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering but, if that was going to come up. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. But, but, you know, there, but it's, it, it's, it's just wonderful to do it with a community of people that you know and that you love and that you I think you know as human beings first and foremost, rather than as whatever your title is, right? Um, so that when Ari asked me to stage manage that that workshop, I was like, okay, cool, I'll give it my best. And she knew that I wasn't a stage manager and probably wasn't legally allowed to stage manage anything. But you know, it's like, okay, I'll 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 do my best for you as long as you also give me the leeway to fail. And I think that's what allowed me to stay in this world. If I had felt the pressure of um, coming into an industry where I was expected to be perfect right from the get-go with no theater background whatsoever, I never would have been tried, you know? And I feel like saying trial by fire sort of makes it sound a little bit more violent than it, <laughs> than it was. <laughs> like, I think, I think that I, I couldn't agree more with Kevin. Like a lot of the, my early experiences in professional theater, all of them were at ART and um, other than acting in plays as a kid, but that hardly counts. Um, uh, but, but it's like you get thrown in, but there's the most supportive, calm group of people around you who just want to see the project go well and want to see you succeed. Um, I think, I think that has had a huge effect on my temperament as a producer. Um, there's a really important perspective, I think, that the artistic and producing department at ART has always had, which is exactly what Kevin articulated. We are going to do what we do really well because it is vital to, you know, the human experience and kind of society as we have it laid out and not to, not to, not at all to diminish what it is that we do, but also we're putting on a show, you know? So like, there's always kind of that um, perspective on, on what it is that we do um, that kind of acknowledges it's like holiness in a way, but also puts it in, in its place, right? Like if, if, if we don't, you know, if X, Y, Z costume thing doesn't come in on time, like no one's going to die. It's going to be, you know, and, and to, and to, and that there's no excuse to treat anyone with anything less than respect and kindness um, regardless of, of, you know, what mistake they may have made. Um, yeah. I, I, I feel that influence in my work every day. 
Yeah, I, I want to pull on the, the costume example in particular, Maddie, and go back to you, Diane, because I, I'm wondering if, you know, you, you were so sure that theater was the place for you. But when was the moment that you had, especially like starting in your producing career, where you were like, this is also producing? Like, I'm supposed to do this part? Like, when, when was there a moment or was there ever a moment where you were like, this seems strange that I would be taking this on? And, and was there anyone who was sort of like, yep, yeah, that, that's what this is? Um, I don't know that there was because I didn't really know what it was. So I just thought whatever someone told me to do, that's what I was supposed to do. Um, and I know that sounds so um, naive and unsophisticated, but I think that I was naive and unsophisticated because I decided um, after graduate school that if you wanted to work in the English speaking theater, the best place to do it would be London. And so with the sort of innocence of youth, I moved to London. Um, I know exactly how much money I had. And um, anybody who knows me has heard me tell this story. They put the wrong stamp in my passport. So I always worked legally. And so there's no way of replicating when people say, how did you get a job in London? And I'm literally, they put the wrong stamp in my passport. So I was always able to work. And I think I was so grateful that people would employ me because I didn't have any background and, and I think I just said yes to everything. I will tell you a funny thing though. When I came to ART um, to produce Sleep No More, I realized on day two that the masks that all of the people who came to see the show had to, um, had to wear had, were being constructed and only like 12 had been made. And in the next month I made 4,000 masks and there was no meeting. Like if we were doing Sleep No More right now, while we were on this call, I would be making a mask. And um, somebody else punched the hole and I sanded them, cut out the eyes, put in the elastic. And I thought at that time, I thought, well, it's been years since I've made props. I mean, that was, that was a bit of a surprise to me. But um, I don't have a sense that I'm too grand for much. So I think that in that sense, nothing was much of a, a surprise to me. Um, it's funny something that Maddie said that I want to pick up on though, because I was thinking about it with our first question. And um, I was thinking weirdly about my father because he and I were temperamentally very, very different, but he was the fire captain in my small town. So everything he did really was life and death. And I think that's why I've always been calm about everything because it's only a show in the best possible way. You know, it's what I've only devoted my life to. So I really believe in it, but I knew my perspective was always, uh, there are worse things that happen. And, and this is, you know, this is a privilege and a joy to get to do what we do and be paid for it and, you know, make a lot of people happy and reach audiences and all those things that give us all pleasure in the theater. So, um, but I was very struck when Maddie said, you know, it isn't life or death. And I thought that's just the perspective to have to, um, to, to keep going. And, you know, I was thinking too, when we were going to do this about who were your role models more than your mentors, like who, and I know role models are often people you don't know, or movie stars that you look up to or something, but mm -hmm. it, I was thinking like, whose behavior did I model myself on? Um, because I didn't have very many obvious people. I also am from small town Ohio, like uh, like Mark, and um, it just wasn't a world that you know that was around for me, um, even at university uh, where I did you know study theater. Yeah, the role, the role model thing is a really good point too, because there's there's so much um, that we're all still very much having to do, like. As a politician, I, I, that's how I've often tried to explain what I do to folks outside the theater, right? It's like, it's, it's a lot of politicking. It's a lot of like making sure that you're hearing people who you're collaborating with, helping them be heard by other folks who might be in that collaboration and really trying to like create the circumstances for creativity to flourish. And I think that is so connected and so in everything that we're all doing now, even though we're sort of attached to different segments of the industry, right? But that, I think that part about emulating behavior, Diane, is a really good, good piece. Um, 
in this sort of conversation about mentorship or producing or or what have you. Um, I don't know if you were if you remember Diane. We were we were Diane was teaching a, a class on producing um, at Harvard College this year, and I was I was the TA. I'd never been a TA in my life. It was very exciting. Um, and uh, in one session, um, uh, a friend of ours, a colleague of ours, Daron uh, Daron J Miles had had us read the US code that was written right to set up the NEA. And I think that's that was where it had this phrase in the code that I was like, oh my God, we were like, that's producing. And it was this creating the conditions for creativity to flourish or for artists to flourish. And I thought, oh, that, that's exactly what it is. But again, I think that's so connected. Um, obviously, Maddie's a producer, but Ari with the Winter Walk, I think that is so, so much connected in there. So we've got creating conditions. Kevin, it's absolutely connected in the work that you do with artists. So. There's so much of that that I feel like is woven into our practice. Well, I feel like a lot of people think that producers just do paperwork, with contracts and stuff. Um, and uh, they're, they're not they're not wrong. We do do a lot of paperwork. But, um, but I feel like there's a, or, or something I didn't understand until I started doing it is that, um, is exactly what you're saying, Mark, is, is creating the infrastructure for people to show up as their best freest, most creative, most generous selves, right? Like, I feel like a lot of the work that we do that may feel boring or uncomfortable, like contracts, like money, like, you know, you name it, um, actually is all in service of the, the work and helping people sh show up able to do their best work. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I just, I'm, uh, that's like one of my, uh, one of my rants that I go on every year. It's like, it's not actually that like boring. It's very important. Um, and, uh, you know, I feel like the importance factor is not lost, but I feel like the, the why, um, is something that I've really only come to understand, um, since I started producing, uh, more professionally. I think it's a similar role for directors too, right? I think in the way that a director's role is to create a rehearsal space where, the designers, the actors, the crew can show up and do their best work artistically. I think it's the, yeah, it's, it's that role of the producer to create that environment for the director and the rest of the team to have an environment that's that is innately collaborative where people can bring their full selves to work. I think when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, it starts with that, right? Being able to bring your full self to the table. And something that I never quite understood about Diane um, was why she had her office in the conference room, like this really fancy person at the ART. Why are you just sitting in the corner of this conference where people are bothering you all the time? But thinking about it through this context, like I would just go in and there and work. She would invite me in and allow me to do my biology research in that space, right? I, I think I did some of my best thesis writing in that, in that area, but it's because there was an energy and an environment where I could show up as my full self, whether it was doing the theater stuff or the academic stuff, um, and Diane never said no. And Mark and Ari never, like I would sit at Ari's desk every day that she was out uh, and no one ever complained. And I, it was it was just sort of remarkable to me that that kind of space existed to begin with, right? Where we could, where I could show up as the person that I am top to bottom um, and and no one would, no one would question it, right? They'd be like, okay, what can we, what can we do for you to make your, life easier here and to make your work product better. Um, that's a more that's interesting theater right. artist too, though, right? I mean, like if showing up as your whole self, I mean, one of the things I like about theater, like I've always been, like Ari said, one of those people who wanted to be everything. Um, and this feels like as close as I've felt like I can get because every project is about something different. And the more you know about the thing that you're working on, the better the better it's going to be. Um, so uh, yeah, couldn't couldn't agree more. Definitely had a meltdown and wrote a paper in Diane's office. <laughs> uh, but Ari, is, I would say it's, it was, there was a similar point to this too because I feel like so much artistic work, in particular, in that that window when I was line producing and, and you and Diane and I were all together, a lot of a lot of some of the artistic work we got done were in those booths in Oberon after a show over a bottle of wine, right? <laughs> Yes, definitely. I mean, I think it goes, it, everything we're all saying is flowing together and, and I'm loving it, but I mean, it is about humans we all know and connect with and we trust each other and we did the work wherever we needed to get the work done and it didn't feel like work sometimes. And I mean, that's one of my favorite things about when the three of us would just be kind of pounding away and the hours would pass and 
we were, were anywhere and everywhere doing it. Um, I think the best work Diane and I ever did was on the floor of Oberon, uh, doing a recap of the Emerging America Festival. Uh, <laughs> I told, I reminded her of this recently and that we were, it was very late. We closed the final show. I think we closed the whole festival with a big late night donkey show. Um, and we were sitting on the floor talking about all the work that happened, you know, there were like 10 shows that happened in one weekend and um, between three organizations with the ICA and the Huntington and we ate a hundred snack bags of chips <laughs> <laughs> and talked about what we loved about it and what we would do differently and what we did a good job on and what we'd fix. And it was one of the most powerful memories I have about how to produce theater is on the floor with chips. <laughs> To, to that end, Diane, I wonder, um, and it can be about uh, one of the four of us, I guess, if you would like, but in, in being a mentor to so many folks, what, what are times that you've sort of watched your mentees like sort of break or you just could sort of see them like, oh, man, this is they're really struggling under the load of this. Not that you, you know, laughed about it, <laughs> but where you thought I like, okay, this is <laughs> this is where I need to like swoop in and. And, and zoom these people out a little bit because they're clearly, you know, really, really focused on something that's stymieing them. And nothing totally springs to mind immediately. So you know, I'll, I'll reflect on that. Um, I think it's a cliche to say women are bossy. I'm the eldest of five. So bossy goes with the territory. So sometimes I don't even know that I'm swooping or zooming in. To help, I'm just like, oh, no, no, here's, we could do it this way. We could do it this way. So I think it's almost unfortunately second nature to me, um, you know, in, in that sense. Um, I, I don't know. I don't, most of my experiences with people um, breaking down because they just can't keep going are with writers and actors. And I'm not saying they're the most vulnerable part of our profession, but they're the frontline workers in that sense, you know, so I think of the number of writers who've cried in my office or needed whatever a handheld because just out of frustration or disappointment in themselves mostly or things like that. And I think actors feel sometimes the same way, you know, in some senses, they're the primary artists in theater because for me, always it comes from the words, the writer, and then the actor has the, the responsibility to deliver those words or to make them alive. So I, I, I don't, that's what I said, I don't, not instantly did any of me think, oh yeah, that time they screwed up, but it's just sort of, my brain doesn't go there. Do you know what I mean? Probably as I said, cause I just started bossing around. So I didn't have to get to that point. Um, yeah. I, I, it kind of goes, it goes back to your role model point though, I will say, um, because there's not, certainly I know there have been moments where I have been sitting with you after some event being like, girl, I, I don't know about that. <laughs> like, just something I had been through. And you're like, I think you need to chill out. There are a lot of days in the year you had one bad day and I think you need to calm down. Um, so there were certainly conversations like that, but I would say there, that idea of emulating behavior, everything that you're talking about and sort of like needing to be with those writers, needing to be with actors, needing to be with artists who like really need that space and encouragement. I would say it's like the biggest thing that I pulled from working for you um, and continue to sort of try to channel in my own frustrations. And when I hear artists say back to me, like, I really appreciate when you held that space for me, I can almost immediately tie it to like, well, this is because this is what I've been taught for the last 10 years working at ART, right? Mm -hmm. I think that is very, very clear. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Diane, I don't think you give yourself enough credit because I feel like you've taken a shot on me doing things that are that were, you know, ahead of my time or out, that felt like maybe I might be out of my depth um, and 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 let me do it my way and and you know fail and come to you when I needed you. Um, and so, just to say that I don't, I don't think that I don't think that I, I certainly don't think of you as a as a micromanager. Yeah. manager um unless you want to be um <laughs> but but i but i felt very i felt very free to make my own mistakes on on uh, yeah every project that you've brought me onto. I, I wonder i wonder i wonder to that end um 
you know, I, I had sort of a, a question I was interested in all this talking about, which was like this difference between um, teaching and mentorship, um, which I think is, it, it might be a question I'm interested in because I don't think it was, it was always clear to me um, until maybe 10 years ago. Um, but there was also someone here in the Q&A who's, Diane, specifically asked for you to te talk about teaching in this producing course um, this past year to Harvard undergrads and sort of the difference in like how we teach that in an academic setting versus sort of the applied nature of, of what we do. So I wonder if we start there, but then kind of kick around this idea of like teaching and mentorship and how they're different and how they're the same. Uh, okay. So I um, had resisted teaching the entire time I was at Harvard. And when we started TDM, the theater, dance and media concentration, they were like, you should teach a course, you should teach a course. And I said, no, 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 until this year, knowing it would be my last, I thought that would just be churlish not to agree to do it. So I had an idea about this producing course, which was that um, Mark, my trustee TA, and I were going to go to the theater every week. And then we would talk about what we saw and develop a critical faculty and talk about what the budget was. And, you know, I'd probably be able to throw in a couple of good anecdotes um, from my my long years of work. And then uh, the pandemic hit. So um, suddenly we were on Zoom and we were not going to go to a theater the entire time, which was very difficult and meant uh, late summer when the reality hit us, Mark and I um, put together a syllabus uh, with our friend Dayron who worked with us on a uh, part of it as well and made a reading list. And I read texts that I hadn't read and reread texts I hadn't read in 40 years. Um, and we, we taught it um, more philosophically, I think, than we would have, as you say, if we'd been hands-on, about um, what kind of producer you'd want to be. Uh, we talked a lot about the, uh, the social justice uprisings that were very present in the country and in an industry that is frequently um, racist. Uh, we talked a lot about how to break that down. But... I think that we talked about how you how you live your life, I guess, but how you can make work that you believe in or Kevin take clients or Ari go and help the homeless now that the way that you do. And um, I hadn't reflected on that sort of part of my work, like the philosophy of the choices I've made about where I work and the plays I do. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it, it, it was, um, there were 10 students. So it was sort of seminarish in the sense that everybody spoke a lot in the class. Um, and most of them were like the equivalent of Maddie and Kevin, that they had theater experiences at, at Harvard or maybe in high school or maybe in summer jobs, but were feeling their way uh, into the profession and, and what it might be. And so for me, that was, it was that kind of teaching. Um, you know, we looked at a budget and we looked at all those things that I always say to people, you can learn how to do this or you can cut and paste somebody else's, which let's, <laughs> that we all do. So you can learn how to do a contract. You can learn how to do a budget. What you have to develop is your ability to have relationships and you have to have confidence in your critical taste without it being uh, like some sort of you know, overwhelming vanity. But, um, you know, my guiding thing, as I said in my class, is, uh, is there was a, a book called Ways of Seeing that was published in Britain in the 1970s by a writer called John Berger. And he said, we only see what we look at. And that's how I've always tried to find work to do. Because if we don't look at people like the whole of Kevin Lynn, or if we don't look at plays, or if we don't look at a social issue, or we don't look at X, Y, Z, um, we're failing, in my view, is our job as producers. So I hope that I tried a little bit to inculcate into the students that they think about what it is that they want to bring into the world. And I get, I know, a bit evangelical about this, because I was laughing today with our director of production, I said, I only have like one hobby, one job and one passion. Luckily, they're all the same thing. So um, it makes me kind of boring, I think, in one sense, because I don't have a wide range of things. But as Maddie said, you've always done a play about something. So you suddenly are 
like a little mini know-it-all. Um, you know, I'll use the Lazors again since they're here. I did not know that much about the Egyptian revolution in the Arab Spring. I now know quite a bit. And, you know, there's all these plays I've done over the years where you have to become, at least for those six weeks or three months, kind of an expert or have expertise in a field. So, so I think it, it's, it's, it's a rich and satisfying life that way because you can become a lifelong student. Um, and I think that in teaching, I guess you're supposed to be, you know, I feel like, Mark, you, you should answer the question. You said you learned 10 years ago what it is. And, you know, um, <laughs> and I'm like, good, just tell us. And then, but I always, I mean, I don't actively sit around thinking, oh, I'm going to be a mentor. But I think that the things that come with mentoring, like being a sounding board, knowing that you have more experience than somebody else, things like that. Um, I think those are hallmarks of good teaching as well. You know, if you want your students to engage and I had fantastically brilliant students. So I never felt that, oh, now I'm trying to tell them this thing about the history of producing. And there is no book that talks about it. I mean, and we know that it was always for years and years, actors who were producers, you know, Shakespeare was an actor and a writer and was a producer. So it's always been an industry that kind of scrambled along, I think, in that way with people, you know, wearing many hats. And it's really the 20th and now the 21st century where people are a bit more niche. And I don't think that that serves our industry. And I, this phrase, they don't have it in England. So people always laugh when I say it, you know, people say, oh, they're a hyphenate, meaning they're like, actor writer da 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 and they don't say that in england yet i'm sure they will but they're like a hyphenate what's that and i said oh now that everybody wears lots of different hats again so sorry that was a bit of a rambling answer but i think that they all end up being married and but you're clearly about to tell me that there's a big difference and you discovered it 10 years ago yeah. no no not at all i think that sometimes there's a priority put on teaching in the classroom and on learning in the classroom and learning in an academic way um, that I would say for my own worth, uh, was not the best way for me. Like I went to graduate school. I wouldn't necessarily advise people to do that, um, after having done it. Um, and I learned a lot more in those first three years by doing and by emulating than I did learning three years in a classroom. Like, sure. I knew my way around Excel and understood how to put payroll fringe uh, <laughs> into a budget like that, but I don't think I needed to go to grad school for three years to learn that to, to your point, I think. That for me is that sort of the root of the of the the separation is sort of taking this priority out of the classroom and out of academia, which can be a very sort of exclusive, isolating place, and putting it sort of on the ground in the practice into application. Um, that's what I feel like I got very specifically from you, um, and has sort of guided me a lot more in, in what I want to do than I ever did in the classroom. <laughs> to not to say thing, here I am. Now I'd give my disclaimers being attached to Harvard. Education is very important. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of space for it. I don't, want to, I don't want to be saying it that way, but just that um, there, there is as great a value in the application um, and the theory than uh, as same as the theory. Yeah, Mark, I couldn't agree with you more. I, you know, Harvard has a great education system, academically speaking, right? The best of the best, and that's what I, that's what drew me to the university originally. But I think where I learned the most was through. The ART, it, truly, it was like it was the the mentorship and the sponsorship, right? I think it was the the idea that um, that Allegra and Diane and Diane and Mark and Ari from day one treated me as a peer, um, rather than as uh, a student who was um, they they never talked to me as if I was uneducated. Maybe I didn't know some things that they could they could teach me, sure, but but it was always the idea of, of lifting me up and bringing me in, um, rather than just a top down approach, right? I think that's, for me these days, I'm thinking more about what is the active version of mentorship, right? Rather than the passive one. How do you, how do you actually sponsor someone's career? How do you, how do you as a mentor invest in them as much as they're investing in your relationship? Because especially in this industry, like everything is so fluid, right? The person who's the intern one day is, is, is the lead of the show the next day, right? Like, and that, um, that's been really gratifying to watch. And I also think to that point, the way that um, Diane has created this, cultivated this community of artists who are also so open in mentoring and sponsoring each other. It's not a surprise to me that that's um, how I have signed so many of my clients. Right? Everyone has this sort of similar shared experience of, um, of being in an artistic home that is so open 
so that when I started SCA, my first clients were Mia Walker, Ricky and Jeff Cooperman, uh, and now it's Tavi and Daniel and Patrick and Sammy and Celine and Justin. It's not, it's not a coincidence, I think, that, that we're all so tied. And um, Maddie, you'll remember this. We did this panel at the Harvard Club a few years ago where it was us and Maddie Smith, and I think Sammy was on it, and Haley Bennett, and, you know, also on the, the offstage side of things, we've also continued to find each other and continue to find ways of collaborating um, in New York and in London and wherever. But it, that's been really special, I think. I never forget that panel because you called me dumb luck. <laughs> and I thought that was that. No, nobody's ever said that. Somebody said something like, well, what, 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 I can't remember what the question was. Something like what, ha, what, what most formed you at Harvard or something. And he went the dumb luck to sit outside Diane's office. I never forgot that. I was like, dumb luck. Okay. I'll take it. That's yeah. True. <laughs> yeah. There's, um, we're, really sort of zooming through this. We've got four minutes left. Um, there's a, a question sort of back to you, Diane, um, which again, I think this sort of relates to your point earlier about like always knowing what you wanted to do and that always having been the focus. Um, but this question um, from Scott saying, what's the story of your, your first sort of major break into professional theater work? And, and who was sort of the influential person for you um, or, or person who saw that spark in you? Um, uh, um, a, a writer director, a British writer director called Peter Gill, who's very well known in uh, England and not really very well known in the United States. And he, um, I got a job as the assistant in the bookshop in the arts center that he ran. And um, he was very shy. And I think he would come to the bookshop a lot to uh, to um, to escape the pressures of running this massive art center, and um, we would I was I read a play a day because I felt like I had to, and um, so he would then talk to me about the plays I read, and so he's the one who really influenced me hugely. And when he left Riverside Studios, where I was working in the bookshop, he took me with him to the National Theater. So a hundred percent it's Peter and that's where everything started for me in that sense, because he took me like the same way. I hope maybe you guys say I've helped you. Like he just took a chance on me because he liked how I thought, or he thought I was, he was molding me. I don't even know what he thought, but, um, but that's, that's where, that's where I went. Um, at that point in England, it was, when did I go there in the eighties? Um, he could just, take me. I mean, I went and was interviewed, but it wasn't like now where there's more rigorous selection processes. So I definitely benefited from, from that. Um, but, but Peter, so that's, that's for me. Well, as we sort of approach the end here, I have one final question I'd love us all to sort of weigh in on. Um, and if you're, when you're starting out, it kind of plays on what you're talking about. Um, Diane, with your relationship with Peter, w when you're starting out, what would your advice be to someone who's like thinking about a career in the theater or a life in the theater or in any other profession, to be quite honest, um, in terms of finding a mentor? What, what is the, how do you, how does one find that person or, or how does one know that that person has come into their life? Ari, right, I'm going to pick on you to go first. <laughs> dumb luck. Let's come back to dumb luck. I don't know for me. I mean, you know, I, it's symbiotic. You, you, you have to find that connection and that trust with someone. And as much as you connect to somebody who you might look up to um, and want to be your mentor, they have to see their ability to share with you. Um, so I think it's just, you know, it's like matchmaking magic. It's, you know, it just kind of happens. I mean, I think there's work you can do and connections to make and all that work that we do in any field to get ourselves through the door and, and meet people and learn about things. Um, but it's finding that true, you know, two way street that, that, that creates it. Um, also, I just, I have to put it in here because there are two people here that do something that I think I would do if I, I if I was mentoring anyone, I would teach this is write thank you notes because the two best note writers on the planet are Diane Borger and Kevin Lynn. Maddie, I'm sorry, you never wrote me any notes. So you probably are included <laughs> as well. 
but <laughs> like, how do I want to give and receive from you? Your your ding ding, thank you notes. I mean, it was it just to, a, a method of expression and gratitude and connection that I think is is something I will carry with me forever from both of you. <laughs> that's, that's nice. It's almost summer break. So we're going to run over and just, I'd love to get everyone to, to jump in on this one. So Kevin, can you go next? Yeah, um, I, I think programs that assign mentors and mentees tend to not work, right? I don't think it's something that can be uh, calculated in that way. Um, I think on the mentees part, it requires a degree of vulner vul vulnerability to say, to, to, to acknowledge what you don't know and to acknowledge the areas where you need to grow. Because I think, um, I'm just thinking about, you know, my time in school, the, the students who felt like they knew everything weren't going to be those successful. They wouldn't find mentors in the way because they thought they knew better, right? So I think it, it requires um, uh, a humility to be able to say, I'm going to go try something new that I, where someone else is the expert and I acknowledge that and I'm okay with that and I want to still play in that space. Um, and then I think it is really the, it's the dumb luck of finding that person who is going to really take you under their wing. I don't think it can. I don't think you control can, can control for it. Um, just on the on the thinking notes point, also handwritten is better than reading that. <laughs> so true, Maddie. Um, completely concur with what everyone has said. Although I will say that I, in my experience at least, um, the way that you can best set yourself up to have the right kind of dumb luck um, is to do two things. One is um, put your head down and do the work um, and, uh, and, and don't be afraid to ask for what you want. Um, I got my first internship at ART because I was taking Ryan McKittrick's dramaturgy class and I really loved the play and I asked if I could work on the play. Um, and then I worked on the play and I uh, felt a little bit like Bugs Bunny running around everywhere doing everything all the time and I kind of thought no one noticed but Diane did so um I could totally agree with dumb luck but also um put your head down do the work and and don't be afraid to ask if there's something that you want um and you've and you've earned the right to ask for what you want in that situation those people will show up for you I think I'm gonna answer next because I'm gonna make you answer last Diane um but uh I I super agree and underline a lot of everything that's being said. I think I'm I'm usually not incre an incredibly sort of spiritual person, but I do feel like these relationships reveal themselves to you. They can't be sought, right? They 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 appear when they are meant to um, amongst the people they are meant to, and um, I think a lot about. I I have said many times in this lunchroom program. I came to ART because I was a Diane Paulus super fan, which I remain, and it's you know it's such a great collaboration with with Diane Paulus and her work. But the thing that I didn't know I was getting was this mentor in Diane Porter and getting to have this experience of the privilege that I'm so glad you said Diane to like work and get paid to do this, and also continue to sort of learn and grow and discover so much more about about what's possible in the career. Um. Well, thank you all. I, I think I've lost sight of the question, but um, but I, I agree that forced mentorships don't, uh, in my experience, work that well. I'm sure there are great programs that I'm just unaware of, but um, I want to say one bit of advice and one other thing. So when Maddie was saying, you know, put your head down and work hard, and you were saying what for young people starting out, and mine is say yes to everything. Don't judge the opportunity like, oh, that's, I'd like to grant for that opportunity because you don't know where anything's going to lead. So Maddie running around like a ever ready battery. Um, yeah, is the other thing. But the other thing I want to say, and I say this um, like with a full heart to the four of you, um, when you mentor people, you get back as much as you give. And so that is uh, one of the joys of growing older, I guess, but it's, it's a two way street and um, it, you know, what do you get back? You get back insights that you didn't have. You get back seeing maybe yourself X number of years ago, you get a connection to a whole different world or a different culture or a different age group, but it, it, it's a two way street. And I always want people to remember that. And when Kevin was speaking earlier about, you know, all of us and giving him things, I thought, well, yeah, because five afternoons a week you were here. 
So um, we got really used to you. And, um, you know, and you just, whatever we asked you to do, you just said yes. And so um, it, it's, a, it's a two-way street. So I'm sure all of you are already or will be great mentors because it's your spirit. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Well, we've five minutes over, not so bad. <laughs> um, and I think this is the perfect, I think this is the perfect words to, to send us off this afternoon, Diane. Um, thank you all so much for jumping into the lunchroom today. Such a, such a great, different conversation. Um, and thank you all, of course, for, for joining us, for watching. Um, I, ha I, I would be remiss not to do a plug for the incredible match generosity that Sarah outlined at the beginning. And I know she's dropped a link in the chat, so please check that out um, as we charge into the last day of our fiscal year next year. Um, Diane, thank you for everything. I know I speak on behalf of a lot of people saying that. Um, and I think... Uh, no, I'll say my one last cliche about the theater. You never have to say goodbye in the theater because everybody's paths cross again. And sometimes it's literally decades um, and sometimes it's sooner than you think. So um, we just have to say till the next time. Yeah. Till the next time, everyone. Thanks for joining today. <laughs>